As global temperatures rise and erratic weather continues across the planet, people around the world are searching for a solution to climate change. One solution to this crisis may be found in the ground beneath our feet. Scientists, researchers, and land stewards are now studying soil and the carbon cycle as a biological solution to climate change. Through photosynthesis, plants absorb carbon from the atmosphere. The process of converting atmospheric carbon dioxide into soil carbon is called the carbon cycle. The carbon cycle uses sunlight, plants, soil, and microorganisms to turn CO2, a climate change causing gas, into soil organic matter. But the soil that can help us solve the climate crisis is disappearing. Soil is a super organism. It's a whole constellation of life down there. Soil is both the receiver of the detritus of life and the, and, and the yielder up of the, the, the source of life. Soil is, is kind of one of the unsung heroes, um, possibly our saving grace when it comes to climate change, because it is one of those things that um, it's not a new technology. It doesn't require massive uh, investment in, in new systems. It literally is pay attention to what's there and try to rehabilitate what we've lost. It's, it's a solution right under our feet. We don't really have to do too much except not destroy it. Most of us are unaware that beneath our feet lies a vast world teeming with life. We depend on this valuable natural resource called soil. Fertile soil supports plants and provides us with oxygen, medicine, food, fiber, and building materials. Soil is home to countless species, nature's ultimate recyclers, that turn waste into value and feed the plants that, in turn, feed us. Soil purifies our water and is a natural reservoir for atmospheric carbon. Civilizations rise and fall due to their management of soil. Our survival depends on protecting and regenerating this important natural resource, this living universe beneath our feet, called soil. by far the dominant source of carbon in the atmosphere is from natural processes. It's from respiration of organisms on the planet. It's from the release of carbon out of the oceans. Um, that's a natural equilibrium between a gas and, and a liquid. But the idea is the amount of carbon that's associated with fossil fuels is just taking that system out of equilibrium. Take it out of equilibrium and it's gonna accumulate. In the atmosphere, excess carbon contributes to climate change. Carbon levels in the atmosphere are now at 392 parts per million. Most climate scientists agree that atmospheric CO2 levels must decrease to 350 parts per million for our continued survival. Much of that excess atmospheric carbon can be returned to the soil through land management practices. We know that plants are the solar panels of the globe. They are taking the energy of the sun and utilizing that to uh, take carbon uh, and, if you will, grow more of themselves. And so plants are really the solar harvesters. And when they harvest, they're harvesting carbon. An essential building block of life, carbon is a naturally abundant element found in all living things. then how does that carbon end up in the soil? Well, probably the biggest way it ends up in the soil is when you have things that die, 
like a dead plant or leaves falling off a tree uh, or roots that are dying back. Those are all made up of carbon and they start going through the process of decomposition. And through that process of decomposition, that carbon ends up in the bodies of all of these soil organisms. What that basically means is, you know, every organism on the planet is a pool of carbon. I mean, we are, you know, so everything that we eat and we incorporate into our bodies with carbon makes us uh, a storage of carbon that's not in the atmosphere. So that we have to ask ourselves, what can we do realistically? Um, and, and the thing that comes to mind is, let's look at how we can pull existing CO2 out of the atmosphere into the, into the soils. And so uh, it's, it looks like the only way we can remove large amounts of, of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is through better stewardship of the Earth's surface. The next frontier is soils. And we know that the toolbox has been well developed. We know how to manage grasslands and rangelands for increased soil health and therefore soil CO2 sequestration. Uh, and it's a huge potential sink. It's ready to be filled up if we're willing to fill it up. We've lost an estimated, some say 50%, some say 80% of our topsoil um, globally over the last couple hundred years through intensified farming practices. Um, and a big part of that soil loss, of course, is soil carbon loss. The implications are that, therefore, our soils have the potential to hold enormous quantities of carbon because we've lost enormous quantities of carbon. And so uh, the, the potential reservoir is, is sitting waiting and we just have to adjust our management so that we are putting more carbon into the ground than we're, than we're allowing to escape. Soil loss is one of the biggest uh, threats to humanity and all life that exists today that is being directly propagated by people. Every year, an estimated 24 billion tons of valuable soil is lost forever. It's pretty well understood, even though we have to uh, rely at this point in time on uh, the way we uh, farm with a lot of heavy tillage um, and uh, using uh, salt-based fertilizers, uh, using uh, a lot of biocides and so forth, that some of these practices, depending on the soil, certainly tillage, are, are having a dramatic impact, uh, number one, on the organic matter in the soils. As soon as we start killing the organisms with these inorganic fertilizers, with these salts, with these toxic chemicals, you just go downhill faster. You destroy more and more of the biology more and more quickly until you're really in a system that you have no choice but to use those inorganic fertilizers. You have to, and you start to see effects on water quality because all of those inorganic fertilizers are highly leachable. Oh, we start seeing rivers and lakes and streams having horrible problems and we have no good water to drink or it starts costing an incredible amount of money to buy the drinking water that tastes okay. So it's having far-reaching consequences. In our whole society, human health is definitely very much involved. Well, animal health is involved. If the plants that you're eating don't contain the nutrients to keep your animals healthy, to keep you healthy, our health is suffering. There are many soils where we've depleted the carbon in them and where good agricultural practice could restore some of that carbon, which would increase the fertility of the soil. It would increase its ability to hold water. It would increase infiltration. You know, carbon in soil is just good for the soil and for the way we tend to use it. Um, but the carbon isn't gonna move from the atmosphere into the soil by itself. You know, water runs downhill because it does. Carbon moves into the soil because plants take it up and they fix it into, into leaves and roots and then that stuff dies and decomposes. So, you know, when I look at the way an ecosystem works, I like to talk about, well, there's the life history of plants and there's the death history of plants. And it's just as important because what happens to a plant after it dies is what controls whether the, soil, the carbon ends up in the soil. But the death history of plants is also the life history of microorganisms, of, of insects, of, of worms, of bacteria, and of fungi. 
And those are all the things that I study, you know, so it's like, yeah, I, like, you know, I study dead plants and they're pretty cool. Healthy soil is alive with billions of organisms, including fungi, bacteria, and invertebrates. We depend on the invaluable array of beneficial ecosystem services they provide. The soil food web is all the interactions of the different organisms that exist in soil performing all the processes to help plants grow in a healthy fashion. So the plant can have all the nutrients that it's supposed to have. It's not going to be subject to disease or uh, insect pests. We don't have to use inorganic fertilizers if we've got a good healthy food web. All those interactions are, are going on. Um, building soil structure, so water and oxygen move into the soil. Um, making nutrients available back to the plants. So it's all of those sets of interactions. So if the soil food web microbes are what actually cause a plant to grow, assist it, immune system, food support, all of that, and we're a society that relies on food resources grown in the soil, uh, then I don't see any way around it but to say that all of a civilization is reliant on the health of the soil and the soil food web microbes. Soil organisms have a very important responsibility to return carbon, to, to, to build the carbon pool that's in the soil. Um, these organisms, especially the fungi, uh, have the ability to eat these food resources that the plant provides. So the plant is fixing carbon from the atmosphere and upwards of a third of the carbon that that plant is sucking out of the air is being pumped into the soil and being fed to this fungi that's in the soil. And so when you have a healthy soil with all of its microbes and the oxygen exchange and the, the ample airspace and, and water storage that's in it and you have this dynamic process that happens so that when we die, when the tree dies, when all of the things of life go back to the ground, that process is healthy, can then cycle that back through, break down everything into its element components and then grow the new garden to allow the next generation to live. The Marin Carbon Project, a collaborative group of researchers, scientists, ranchers, and farmers, is investigating how specific land management practices affect soil carbon levels. Using managed cattle grazing and compost application, they are testing to see if these methods increase the ability of rangeland or grassland soils to remove and store more carbon from the atmosphere. The easiest way to get at the question of could we sequester carbon in our rangeland soils was simply to add some. Add some carbon to the system and see what happened to it. And the easiest way for us to do that was to put some compost on the ground. So we decided to put about half an inch of compost out on some rangelands, both in Marin County and up in the Sierra foothills. And then we followed the course of that. We followed the course of carbon in those ecosystems for the next, well now going into the fourth year. The results were, on one hand, kind of what we expected. Yes, we were able to sequester carbon in those soils, but they were actually much better than we, we expected. Because not only did we increase soil carbon by the amount of carbon that we added in the compost, but we stimulated a change in those systems so that they were actually able to photosynthesize at a greater rate. In other words, their, the grasses were stimulated to grow and, and absorb more CO2 as carbon than they, than they would have had we not added the compost. Our treatment plots gained significant amounts of carbon, not only in the plant biomass above ground, where we saw a 50% increase in forage production, but we also saw a significant increase in below ground carbon. In addition, not only did we see an increase in below ground carbon, but we saw that carbon in a form 
that was long-term carbon. So the carbon shows up in different pools in the soil. Some of it tends to turn over rather quickly, and some of it sticks around for a long time. So we actually saw a significant increase in, in a, the occluded light fraction in the soil, which is carbon that's going to be there for a very long time. So it's very, very exciting results and, and actually much better than we had anticipated. Here's an a example of a purple needle grass, bunch grass. You can see the, kind of the size of the crown of this plant. And the roots on this are probably going down roughly two feet to three feet deep. And it's these native perennial bunch grasses that we're really hoping to encourage with our grazing practices. Uh, the grazing helps in, in that it, it tends to remove the annual biomass and tends to give the uh, perennials a little more room to grow. Perennials are, are deeper rooted than the annuals. They're growing all year. So the annuals sort of disappear in the summertime and can tend to leave the soil bare or, or poorly covered. And the perennials are there for the duration. Some of these plants will live hundreds of years. So the Marine Carbon Project has established through our research that there's an intact mechanism that's distributed globally that has the potential to remove all of the atmospheric CO2 we need to remove to get down below 350 parts per million. What we're cur currently working on now is the calculation of the land area required to do just that. Grasses, if done properly, can be in a very effective way of just sucking CO2 out of the air and getting it in the ground in the form of the plant roots uh, for, for almost, for virtually ever. Because until somebody comes along and disturbs the soil, if nobody does that, then those, those deep-rooted plants will, will hold that CO2 in the ground for an indefinite period of time until there's some disturbance that comes along. Much of the earth is covered in rangelands. These areas, if managed properly, may have the potential to sequester large amounts of carbon dioxide. The challenge with that is that you need to bury the carbon in the soil in a way that it stays buried. It's sort of the concept that I think of as sort of zombie soil. You, know, you need to leave it in the ground. If, if you bury carbon in the ground, it may come back you know, and be decomposed and released as CO2. And carbon isn't sequestered if it's only buried for a week or a year. Carbon needs to be stored for decades for it to really contribute to pulling carbon out of the atmosphere and fighting global warming. So we've done experiments where we take soil from a meter deep and, and the carbon in that soil is on average several thousand years old. And then we incubate it in a lab and see how much carbon dioxide is produced by the bacteria and very little is. Um, but then you dry those soils and rewet them, and you dry them and rewet them, and each time you rewet them, you get another burst of carbon, and you grow a new population of microorganisms. And the carbon dioxide that's released when we when we carbon date it is six to eight hundred years old, on average. In nature, animals play an important role in building healthy soil. By mimicking natural systems, ranchers and land stewards can increase soil fertility, improve animal health and store more carbon in their soil. One of the, the, the primary benefits and links that's really neat about all this is the grass-fed food link. And this, I came to this through our work with ranchers and farmers uh, in New Mexico. We began to look at not just local food systems, but going back to nature's model of grass-fed food, meaning that animals that eat grass their entire lives. They don't go into feedlots, they're not fed all that stuff. Uh, they they're eat grass, which is what nature wants them to do. And so there's a whole kind of thing around grass-fed food, which is healthier for you, frankly. I won't go into all the details. But the link then to climate and to carbon and soils is a, is a perfect fit, because these animals are on grass all their lives. Right, so it's better for, as a consumer product to, to be eaten. It also brings more money to the rancher because it's a higher value. They can sell it for a higher value. Uh, and if you manage the land properly, these animals are out there doing the carbon work for you. The chickens and the cows together form a very sustainable holistic system. What I mean by sustainable holistic is that we don't need very little external inputs in order to be able to raise those two breeds of animals. The, the cows naturally eat grass. 
and the chickens follow the cows through the pasture and what they do is they do uh, several things for us. The first is they dig through the cow manure patties and while well, their natural instinct is to scratch and they will vacuum up all those nasty bugs that really bother our cows. So in the form of fly larvae and eggs and those kind of things. The second thing they do is by nature, virtue of the fact that they're scratching, they spread out the cow manure. So I don't need a tractor anymore to go out there and do that for me, thereby saving a lot of diesel fuel. So now I have an animal doing my work for me, which is really great, because that's what it's all about. And then the third thing they do for me is um, they provide high nitrogen fertilizer for us that makes the grass grow back nice and thick and lush. That allows us to put the cows back on and eat it all the way down again. So that forms a nice, close system. Come on. The type of, of grazing that we're doing here is management intensive grazing and there's a few other names for it. People also call it mob grazing and the general idea is you get a big mob of cows and you get them in an area of grass where they can eat all the grass in one day and you move them on to the next place and then you don't bring them back until the grass is fully mature again. They will graze the area they're in in 24 hours. So at this time tomorrow we'll be moving them one step forward. Nature likes to farm with animals. Nature's always farmed with animals. Bison running across a big plain and stopping and eating is a form of agriculture in a sense. I know that sounds kind of crazy, but if you go back, that's what they were doing. They, there's a relationship between grass and grazers. It goes back millions and millions of years, not with cattle, of course, but with herbivores, wild herbivores, eating and moving on. So that, that relationship between grass that grows and it gets eaten, and the roots go out and the roots grow up and all that sort of stuff has been going on for a long, long time. And what many ranchers that we work with are trying to get back to that model, back to sort of nature's image of grazing in arid and semi-arid landscapes. Um, and once you start mimicking that, then you have healthier ecosystems. And now we know that, that means more carbon sequestered in soils. So it's really, really a nice loop all the way around from the sun to the soils to the plants to the food uh, to you. So we've actually never grazed this area uh, with electric fencing. This used to be harvested with our tractors. Uh, so this is, you know, a real uh, change, basically, a real conversion in a, a more sustainable way of doing things. So we're in the process of learning how we do this, and, and so far we've seen really good results. And uh, it's pretty interesting to see what the cows actually do here. Here they come. In terms of you know what they can do for us, they're much better at tilling up the soil. Um, you could see they leave you know, a lot of pock marks in the ground, and and they push in some of the green matter, and they allow it to compost better. Uh, they also allow these pockets where water can accumulate, so if it rains, we absorb a lot more water than a place that's been tilled flat because there's all these little cups, essentially, that can catch the water and let it slowly filter in. It also increases the surface area of the field by making it more corrugated, so there's more places for seeds to germinate. Livestock, whether they're chickens, cattle, or pigs, whatever, they're, they're important because they, they will eat the, the organic matter. They'll eat the grass and the, the leaves and, and branches, and they'll convert it into manure. And that manure is so nutrient dense, and it's also um, organic matter dense. And you, you lay that down, and then, then, then you, the grass grows in it, and then they eat it again, they lay it down. It builds topsoil over time. This hen is, weighs about eight pounds, and she'll eat about her weight in food every month every month and a lot of that a lot of that uh, food can come be kitchen scraps or scraps from the garden
they can be chicken biorecyclers. And what that does is it diverts the, uh, the, the food scraps from the solid waste management system, which is wonderful. So that decreases taxpayer dollars. But it gets even better because then you can use that nitrogen-rich manure and combine it with leaf and yard waste and compost it and can keep all the leaf and yard waste out of the solid waste management system. So that's how they can be clucking civic service workers and truly save pa taxpayer dollars. And at the same time, then, you save you get your topsoil to grow your food in. I mean, it's a beautiful cycle when you complete the loop. The beauty of, of all of this is that anyone who has the, the access to a piece of land, and it could be your backyard, it could be a flower box, um, has the capacity to participate in this process. So really it's about just getting out on the land and engaging with it um, intentionally, um, knowledgeably, but proactively to begin to accelerate the rate at which we're building soil carbon. Climate change and our impact upon the environment will determine our future. Anything that we do to increase soil fertility could be a step in reversing climate change. Through land management practices, we can take excess carbon out of the atmosphere and put it to beneficial use in the soil. What if a solution to climate change was found in the ground beneath our feet?